Sunday live stream, and today we have a special edition where we're going to talk about specifically new sensors for the Micro Four Thirds cameras. But even more special than that, I have a special guest, uh, Ben Chapel uh, from the Narrowband channel. He has a, a YouTube channel called the Narrowband, and he focuses primarily on uh, astrophotography for Olympus cameras. So uh, if you haven't seen his channel and you have an interest in astrophotography, definitely check that out. But he also has a very in-depth knowledge of sensor technology. And um, so the today's stream is going to be a little bit technical, but we'll try and, you know, keep make sure everyone keeps up with everything. Uh, and, um, you know, because there's been a lot of chatter, I guess, about new sensors that came out from Sony recently and, and with announcements with the Panasonic GH6 coming and then also Olympus. Uh, announcing that they're going to have a new camera or flagship that's going to wow everybody. Uh, we, we thought we'd take a look at what, what sensors have been coming out and try to speculate a little what we expect the sensors to be coming in our new cameras uh, in the GH6 and more specifically the Olympus cameras. And maybe also talk about some sensors that probably will not be in the camera that a lot of people have predicted might be an option and, and give you reasons why and ho hopefully help you understand why some sensors are not ideal for uh, consumer level cameras and other sensors have so much potential and it would seem very likely that these sensors would be coming into our new cameras. Uh, but without further ado, uh, let me bring in Ben and then uh, let me see who's here. Wow, we have all the usual suspects here. That's awesome. I appreciate everyone coming in today. but. Here is Ben, and chime in and make sure there's audio. You guys can hear both uh, Ben and I when we get started. Hi, Rob. It's Ben. Hey, Ben. <laughs> I'm so glad you could make it today. I appreciate you being here with us today. And uh, you know, you you have a terrific channel, and you've been talking about astrophotography for Olympus. And we're not going to, you know, obviously we're not going to talk much about astrophotography today. But um, tell me a little bit about your channel, but also um why you're you know a little bit about why astrophotography has helped you to learn more about sensor technology and what makes you kind of an expert or give you make gives you a very educated opinion about what we're going to be talking about today oh uh, well i'm no genius but i just <laughs> i guess you built me up quite a bit here i'm going to try and <laughs> meet the standard I if i can so uh, hi hi everyone i'm ben and I'm I'm also on Grimstad. If you want to see the photos that I take, um, look on Instagram for me as Grimstad. G R I M S T O D. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'll put I'll put your That's... links in below after the stream yeah. uh, for everyone to see. Yeah, yeah. So... I, I did put your YouTube channel on in the link below, so. Oh, thank you. You guys can check that out first, but I'll add the links to your other uh, social media links. All right. Well, let's answer your question though. So. The astrophotography community, I guess astrophotography is very uh, technically difficult and it's a very technical field. And most of the people that are in it have some scientific background or they literally like science. I know I love science myself, the scientific method especially. And so uh, if you get onto any of the astrophotography forms, when they're evaluating new cameras that are coming out or new sensors, there's tremendous amounts of chatter, and a lot of these people have access to the ability to test stuff, like unlike in, in ways that you know somebody with a, a consumer camera would never be able to do. So I guess that's kind of where a lot of my technical um, knowledge comes from is just reading and learning and kind of you know gleaning the forms and so forth. Especially on cloudy nights, um, there's a tremendous amount number of people over there who just have huge amounts of knowledge when it comes to you know the sensors and how they work and just all the, the statistics and the, the, the technical field behind this you know it's it's quite deep right to say the least right because astrophotography is the most challenging i think type of photography when it comes to sensors oh yes it, sensor definitely, design. it definitely strains equipment more than any other type of photography out there you know we are we are pushing the boundaries way past anything that you could ever possibly do in daytime photography. Right. And I think a really good example of um, that that we talked about before was, you know, the EM1 Mark II and the EM1 Mark III have the same sensor in them, mm -hmm. but there's a reason the EM1 Mark III is so much better. 
Yes, um, heat. It's the heat, right? Mm -hmm. They did a much better job with the circuit board. I guess the new processor runs cooler, and also mm -hmm. maybe they've done some design changes internally to keep it cooler. But uh, even though they have the same sensor, there's a reason you'd get the M1 Mark III over an M1 Mark II specifically mm -hmm. for astrophotography. Yeah, and, and I also say that because that, that particular aspect of what makes that camera good is, is a thermal aspect, um, the longer exposures you're doing, the, the greater the differentiation that you're going to see between the Mark I and the Mark II. You know, because, yeah. you know, heat is something that builds up noise in a sensor, you know, over time. And the more time you give it, the more heat there's going to be there, the more noise is going to be there. Yeah. And, and you know, when it comes to heat, uh, Build up on the sensor. We're gonna we're gonna discuss that a little bit about these new sensors, uh, you know, later on. So, but that's why I wanted to use that as an example uh, because there's reasons for the different technologies we'll be talking about, and one of them has a direct effect on heat. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that. But uh, Ben's prepared a uh, just a brief slideshow for us. And the slides, each slide is going to be numbered in the top right. So, you know, hold off any, any questions you might have during the presentation, but make a note of the slide number if you had a question about something on that particular page so that after we finish the presentation, uh, you can reference that slide number, just say number one or number five and ask your question rather than having to go back and say, remember that slide that had that thing with the other thing, you know, cause I know you don't have too many lines to type <laughs> in the chat section. So you can just say, uh, number six, you know, what about this IMX something, right? Uh, something like that, uh, to save us, you know, make things a little bit more uh, cohesive, but, uh, okay, Ben, uh, why don't you go ahead and, uh, I'll pull up your uh, screen. Whoops. It went off. Oh, sorry. I I thought I was sharing it. It's okay. It'll be back, I'm sure. There we go. How's that? Okay, good. And all right, take it away. Okay, so uh, we all know that like sensors, <clears throat> sensors collect light and turn it into basically an electronic signal. And from that, we, we get an image. Okay, so... Over the past 20 years, okay, there's been a lot of development in sensors. I know when I first got into photography, you know, digital sensors weren't even a thing, actually. We were all still using film when I first got into photography. And originally, I think my E1, which was the first digital SLR that Olympus ever came out with, I think its quantum efficiency was something in the range of like 20, 25%. And quantum efficiency is basically how much light the sensor is capable of actually detecting. And, and before we kind of like get in depth into this, I want to give a little bit of background about noise and where it comes from. So there's essentially two really big groups that we can categorize noise in. But within each group, there's many, many subdivisions. But we're just, for the sake of simplicity, this, this not being a, a presentation about noise, this is a presentation about sensors. We're just going to talk about the two groups. The number one is shot noise, and the other one is read noise. Now, read noise has a whole bunch of other categories, you know, bias-based noise, thermal-based noise, flat-based noise, pattern-based noises that all have to have, they all have to do with stuff that is within the sensor that's below the silica. So if, if we could simplify this, let's think shot noise is everything from above the silica. Read noise is everything below the silica. And most people tend to focus on the advancements that have been made in sensors as it pertains to shot noise. And that, and that, that has to do with the quantum efficiency of the sensor. Um, so we've been putting micro lenses on the sensors for a long time now. I think the E1 actually, I'm not even sure if the E1 actually has micro lenses on it. The early sensors didn't have them at all. But those micro lenses are a they're a part of shot noise in that they're basically directing more light onto the actual sensitive area of the sensor and thus giving us a larger sample size. And with a larger sample size, we can create a cleaner, better image. Okay. Now, like I said, from you know the early beginnings of digital photography to today, we've gone from about 20% efficiency to the majority of today's sensors being around 90%. And that equates to about a two or maybe two and a half stop range. 
as far as like ISO performance goes. Now you're probably thinking, just, well, wait a minute. If I compare the ISO performance of a camera from 20 years ago to a camera of today, there's definitely more than a two and a half stop improvement in ISO performance. And that's because quantum efficiency isn't the whole story. There's a lot going on in the electronics of the sensor and the way the electronics are designed, uh, the size of the electronics and so forth that have to do with read noise, which is everything that happens at the silica and below, right? And so all the, the read noise is something that we've been able to actually make a tremendous amount of improvements upon, although they're, they're usually much smaller increments and they're not quite as easy to define. So I guess it's kind of one of the reasons why the forums, people don't really talk about it as often. So let's go on to the next slide. So we're going to talk today mainly about Sony sensors and a little bit about their development and you know the different kinds that they have. And Sony they divide their sensor tech okay into five different categories. You know the first one being automotive, and then there's industrial sensors, security sensors, consumer camera sensors, and then lastly mo mobile camera sensors. Now. A lot of these sensors, they all mainly use like a lot of the same technologies and many of the technologies that are in them overlap in quite a ways. And so you'll actually often see sometimes industrial sensors will get thrown into consumer cameras. And sometimes, you know, mobile phone sensors will get thrown into industrial equipment and vice versa. You know, you'll see all sorts of mix-ups um, of one type of camera going into another type of industry all the time. But most of the time, you know, this is this is how Sony breaks it down for us. They they're trying to simplify it and make it easier for us. Now, the automotive sensors that Sony categorizes and puts in the websites, I have never really seen any of them show up in a consumer camera, so we're not really going to talk about them much. And most automotive sensors, they're designed to detect street lights and signs and the distance of objects and so forth. Um, they're not really designed for visual work and also the images that they produce often don't don't materialize well to our eye because you know they're designed to make machines talk to each other now industrial sensors on the other hand a lot of these sensors often get put into consumer cameras and this right here is a typical chart that you will see on Sony's website and on the left side here you know they make, they break this down pr pretty easily for us on the left side we see the size of the sensor, you know, at the bottom, four thirds, and then APS-C, 35 millimeter, and then a couple medium formats. And then at the bottom, we have a graph that going to the right, which is increasing in megapixels. So we start at 26 megapixels for this particular chart, and we go up to 150. And then each sensor is indicated by a box, and of course, they're color-coded based on the size of the pixels or some other type of uh, way of the Sony has been splitting them up, and they usually have the frames per second that that sensor is capable of producing. And that frames per second is often a pretty important indicator as to whether or not a sensor like that might be ideal for a digital camera or not. Now, I'm sure a lot of you four thirds guys, you've noticed that there is a four thirds sensor on this chart, and that's the IMX 492. It's at the bottom here. And I think about two years ago, this is either around when the EM1X was going to get launched, or maybe it was the EM1 Mark II or III. Uh, a lot of chatter was going on, and people thought that Olympus might use the IMX492 sensor uh, for a digital camera. But if we look at the frames per second on this camera, we, we know that it's not really a good solution. But, you know, it's been used in digital cameras, and it is actually a very interesting sensor. And so we're going to talk about it a little bit because it's, it's got some really neat tricks up its sleeve, so to speak. You know, it does some unique things that, you know, are, are big technological advancements, if you will. Now, this camera right here, this is made by ZWO, and it has the IMX 492 sensor in it. It's a mono version of it. This sensor comes in both a color banner, a color barrier pattern, and then, you know, a mono version of it. And ZWO does a great job of kind of splitting up and, and categorizing and, and giving even icons for us all the different you know aspects of this sensor and how it kind of performs there's only a couple on here that don't really interest us but let's start at the top we have like the actual name of the sensor and then we have the size of the sensor its effective imaging area you know what kind of format it, it could work with 
And then, of course, we have the resolution of pixels. And, and then there's another very important thing here, and this is the ADC, or Analog Digital Conversion Unit, is in 14-bit. That means that the signal that comes off this sensor will be 14-bit signal. And a 14-bit signal is obviously, obviously in this number right here, higher numbers are better, okay? Uh, we want more bits because more bits mean more values and more shades. And the smoother transitions are in values from a dark shade to like, let's say a gray and then into a light shade, the smoother that transition is, the more natural it's going to look and the more pleasing it is to our eyes. So higher 14-bit, this is actually pretty good. 14-bit is quite good. A lot of older sensors were 10 or 12-bit. Uh, now the next one here, this is one that gets talked about quite a bit on the astrophotography forums, and that's the read noise. So the read noise is is part of that noise that happens below the sensor. It's the silica and below, and it's any time you basically read a signal off the sensor, no matter what the specifications are of that reading, no matter what the shutter speed, no matter what the gain setting or ISO, no matter the temperature of the camera, this camera will always leave give you a minimum signal. And as you can see, this one's, a, they gave us two numbers here. It's, that's because this signal changes based on the gain setting of the camera. So at a lower gains, or at the, at the highest gain setting of this camera, it's a 1.26 electrons per photon of light, okay? Whereas on the right here, it's, it, goes, it goes as high as eight electrons. And then, of course, this, this camera is a cooled camera, which doesn't really pertain to us in photography too much. Um, the, the next icon is just the buffer that they've put in it. And that would be kind of similar to, like, the processor that's in the EM1 Mark II versus the EM Mark III. And then, of course, it's a USB 3 camera. And, and then down here, and this is one of the big things that tipped me off that this particular sensor would not be a good choice for Olympus when, when it was kind of rumored in the, in the forums and stuff that this might be one. And that's the frames per second. It's only 16 frames per second at its maximum resolution. And that's, that's simply not fast enough. Uh, Olympus's current cameras do 60 frames per second. And I might also add that in order to have good autofocus, you need a sensor that can do very high frame rates, especially for a mirrorless camera. Uh, the next important item here is the full well capacity. So the full well capacity is the silica that the, the actual pixel consists of. And the deeper and larger that silica is, usually that means that we will also have a higher bit rate, but also it means that the camera can receive more signal before it gets saturated or you know blown out, so to speak. So the, the bigger this number is, and this one here, each pixel has the capability of accepting 66,000 photons of light. You know, the bigger that number, the better, obviously. Next is the QE, and this is something that most of the daytime photography uh, forums and stuff kind of obsess about. It's, it's a 90% quantum efficiency sensor, and that's because it's a, it's a backside illuminated sensor. It's one of the newer ones, and almost all of them are on 90% these days. And then lastly here, we got pixel size, it's, and this is measured in microns, which is a very tiny increment, and uh, 4.63 microns is actually quite large. Now, if you're wondering, okay, which of these particular characteristics here have to do with ISO performance, that would be the read noise, the full wall depth, the quantum efficiency, and then the pixel size. Those four aspects right there directly relate to how a sensor will perform in low light. The rest of these characteristics, they have to do with frame rates and autofocus speed and whether or not it's compatible with your system or not. Now, that being said, this camera actually has kind of a, a, a neat trick up to its, it's actually got a bunch of neat tricks up its sleeve. So it has the ability to bin or group pixels together in four by four packets, okay? Because I know, and, and the last slide here is, we were talking about it as, as if it's a 11 megapixel camera, okay? Well, it's actually not an 11 megapixel camera. It's actually a 44 megapixel camera, but it's a quad barrier camera, which means that the pixels are grouped in these groups of four, and the camera can read the pixels off either in groups of four, or it can read them individually. And when you read them individually, obviously you get the highest resolution, but when you read them in groups, 
well, you're going to get a much more sensitive camera. And it, it changes some of the performance characteristics of it. So, for example, if we look at the bottom here, I've got a bunch of information written. When the camera is unlocked and it's in its bin one mode, that means we're just reading one pixel at a time, it will produce a 12-bit file. Now, when it's in bin two mode, it'll produce a 14-bit file because obviously we're able to collect four times as much information per group of pixels. Now, the, my, the pixel size, though, is one-fourth, obviously. Once it's in its one bin mode, it's 2.3 microns, which would be pretty small. But when we bin them together, well, now you've got a much bigger uh, bucket, so to speak, to catch light in. And it's, it's 4.6 microns. Now, the only disadvantage to this is that there's a resolution drop. So once in its bin one stage, you get a, a huge 44 megapixel file. But when it's in its bin two stage, you get an 11 megapixel file, you know, which I actually find 11 megapixels would be adequate for most of my stuff. And then I do have the, the resolutions of each kind of exactly marked out here. But then another interesting thing here is that the full well capacity of each individual pixel is only 14,000 electrons. But when you combine them, well, now you have four buckets essentially working as one bucket, and now they can work as one, and you can get a much, much deeper well of 66,000, you know, electrons, so to speak. Now, also there's differences in the way that this sensor reads the actual um, silica, okay, and it converts that signal from an analog signal to a digital signal. And there's this processing unit, and they're called an ADC, or Analog Digital Converter, okay? And What's interesting about this sensor is that when it is in its bin one mode, okay, which is on the right here, it only has one ADC per pixel, okay? It can only process, it can only process the data in one way. And with an ADC, as we increase the gain, you look at the bottom graph here with the red line on it, as we increase the gain, which is the amplification that we apply to the analog signal coming off of the actual silica, the noise actually goes down as the ISO or gain goes up. And as you can see here, its best spot is actually 270. Once, once it gets to that spot, it kind of levels out. But the negative to this, to going to a higher ISO, to going to a higher gain rate, even though there's technically less noise, what happens is this dynamic range, which is this blue line up here, goes down. Okay, so noise goes down, but the dynamic range also goes down. And, and a lot of times the dynamic range is going down faster than the noise is going down. Although in this particular camera, it actually, they kind of meet at the end pretty well. Now over here on the right, this is the way the camera, it actually performs quite differently once we bin it. And that's because it has two different ADCs that it can use to read the, uh, the the silicate, okay? So when we're at gain zero, which would be the lowest ISO of this camera, you know, it has this particular dynamic range and uh, I think like a, a read noise of eight, all right? And I think that's like a, a dynamic range of, of 13 stops. However, as the gain goes up, once we hit 120 gains, you'll see this jump in both graphs. And what that is, is that's the camera is switching over to a different ADC or a different converter. And it's using a different, you know, different converter. And what's interesting about this is, is that each ADC can actually kind of be fine-tuned and designed to work at a sweet spot, so to speak. And in an ideal world, we would have an ADC for every single ISO. Because what happens here when we switch to 120 gain, noise drops dramatically, and the dynamic range actually goes back up a little bit. And in theory, in, in an ideal world, we would have an, I, an ADC for every single ISO, and we could have like basically a, a sawtooth-looking graph over here that it would eventually go down, but you know it wouldn't go down as fast. So, so that's kind of some of the interesting things about this sensor is it's got these multi ADC units that allow it to, you know, kind of work better at higher ISOs, so to speak. So how are we doing on time?
Sorry, I, I turned my mic off because oh, I, right. I wanted to listen. <laughs> but yeah, we're doing well. Okay, um, good. So basically, this is uh, what some some people are saying is like a dual ISO feature in a camera yes. that we hear about sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and the, to achieve that, they basically need an ADC, an yeah, extra analog, ADC, right? Analog digital converter. I see. And, and that's expensive. You know, it's it's another option that you add to your sensor. So all right, let's move on. So let's go on. This is the next category here. So these are the security camera section of Sony's website. And, and these particular sensors are mainly designed to kind of do one thing, and that's to work really well in low light as well as bright time, bright daytime conditions. They're not particularly fast. They don't usually have, they have virtually never, never, never have any uh, phase detect pixels on them. So they're not great for autofocus. Now, with that being said, though, some of these sensors have made it into a few digital cameras. And, and actually, like this is another one from ZWO. This is the, uh, the ZWO 294. Which is, it's been around for a while. I think this camera has been around for about five years now. You know, but as you can see, it's got a fairly low read noise of 1.2 electrons. And that number does scale. They just don't have the other one listed there. It's got a 14-bit. ADC conversion, you know, it's got deep, deep wells, 63,000 electrons. It is slower though, and that's kind of why this, this sensor doesn't tend to show up in too many cameras. You know, I know that they list the quantum efficiency here is not listed, but really it, it, it's very close to 90%, and, and that's been measured a few times by some people. And then uh, the pixel size, of course, it's 4.6 microns because, because this, interestingly enough, this sensor has the exact same size pixels as the last one that we talked about, but this sensor can't be binned. This doesn't have a quad by air system on it at all. It's just a plain Jane sensor. And here's two cameras that this sensor has actually shown up in, uh, the Zcam E2, and then of course one of the Blackmagic pocket cameras. And most video guys, like the, the big high-end studios and stuff, they're manually focusing their lenses so the fact that this sensor doesn't have any phase can phase type pixels on it uh, is not really a losing factor for them. They're they're mainly just interested in a good image, and that's what this sensor produces. It produces a good image, and it has a fast enough frame rate that it can be used for video. You know, you just you're not going to do any high speed videography with these. All right, so here we are to the consumer camera section, which has a lot. A four third sensors in it. There's actually four of them here, and some of them, and some of them aren't even listed. Um, so let's talk about the IMX 299. That's this is a this is an interesting sensor. It it runs at 60 frames per second, and it shows up in two Panasonic cameras. It, it shows up in the GH5S as well as the BGH1. You know, it's it's an 11.7 megapixel camera. It's actually kind of similar to the ZWO 294 that I showed earlier, only this one has the ability to do a higher frame rate. Um, but, you know, you're kind of seeing here a little bit of pattern. Like these, these sensors, you know, they're a lot of them are like brothers. You know, they're like, they're like the same model car. They just have different features added to them, if you will. Let's move on here. Here's another sensor. And when I first stumbled across this sensor, I thought to myself, man, this would be a cool sensor to have an Olympus camera because... The quantum efficiency of this sensor is eighty-four uh, percent. It's it's quite high, uh, although it's actually technically kind of low for a backside illuminated sensor, which is what the sensor is. Um, but the problem with this sensor is that it, it doesn't have the frame rate. Uh, it, it doesn't. It won't take sixty frames per second like the current Olympus sensors will. You know, it has three point three micron pixels. It's got the same twenty megapixels that current Olympus cameras have. It's twelve bit, just like current Olympus cameras. You know, it's a it's a very close twin to the sensors that Olympus uses, with the exception that this particular sensor is a backside illuminated sensor, and the current sensors that Olympus are using are front side illuminated, which means they have a lower quantum efficiency. And this sensor, you know, it's you're not going to be able to do very good autofocus with a sensor like this because there are no phase detect pixels on it. And, but it does actually show up in a couple, it even shows up in a four-thirds camera. The Y1, which is from a Chinese company, um, they managed to get it to work by using contrast detect autofocus, which is not a great way to autofocus, but you know it, it does work. 
And I know if I could go back actually a little ways, the the IMX two ninety nine, you know, all these cameras are using contrast to detect autofocus because they don't have those 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 face detect pixels on there. And oh yeah, here's a, and the Altair Pro. That's, that's another camera out there that also uses this sensor, and that's that's an astrophotography camera. So let's talk a little bit about sensor exclusivity. Okay, before we get into the sensors that Olympus is actually using. So if you're a manufacturer of a camera and you come to Sony and you want to buy a sensor, so to speak, um, you can elect to do to basically sign a contract with them in a couple of different ways. And, and depending on the exclusivity that you get is going to increase or decrease the cost. So you can have total exclusivity to that sensor. Let's say you, you put together a really well-designed super balanced, you know, kind of has all the nice features in it type sensor that's perfect for a digital camera. Well, obviously you wouldn't want to put out your very expensive camera and then a few months later have some other Chinese company come out with, you know, a cheaper one, but with the same sensor, you know, a knockoff essentially. So you can buy exclusivity from Sony, but that of course is going to have a higher cost. And then you can get another contract that you can kind of get with Sony is you can get a limited time period where like you have exclusive rights to that sensor for a certain number of years, like a year or two. And that would have a more medium cost. And the reason why Sony is going to charge more is not they're trying to chip you or anything like that. It's because if they can, if they know that they can sell that sensor to other people, they know they can make a big lot of them. And so be able to sell off them sell them off to other people and, and thus kind of, you know, make more money off of it, essentially. It's, it's making the pool bigger, so to speak. And then, of course, no exclusivity whatsoever. All of the sensors that we've been talking about, the ones that are listed on Sony's website on these, these charts, all of those sensors are either non-exclusive sensors, in other words, the, the people that had them designed didn't get exclusive rights to them, or they're an older sensor that has expired you know their their contract period has has basically expired and now it's out in the public market so the imx 270 this this is an answer which which doesn't show up on Sony's website because it's an exclusive sensor to to olympus okay and and really th this sensor is a great sensor okay um it's fast it's got face detect pixels all over the thing 120 different places there's face detect pixels you know, it does 60 frames per second, which is just, is really quite good. Now, it is a rolling shutter type camera, which with the older non-stacked front side illuminated sensors, um, that, that is a lower noise type sensor, okay? If you read the entire frame and then read the entire frame versus reading it out in columns, um, you're going to get more noise with an older sensor if you read the entire frame. And so that's kind of one of the reasons why Olympus chose the rolling shutter. They just they just made sure that the sensor was so fast that that rolling shutter doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really annoy your eye too much. But anyways, the IMX270, you know, it shows up in almost all of Olympus cameras today. You know, they have they definitely gotten their money's worth out of this sensor and they've been exclusive for a very long time. Now, the GH5 Mark II that just came out Based on the specs that I'm seeing on that camera, I am, I am very confident, you know, although I don't have total proof on this, that that sensor and that camera is an IMX270, okay? And Sony, I think, has discontinued their exclusivity contract with Olympus, and so they are now able to sell it to a few other people, and they probably had a bunch laying on the shelf, and they said, Panasonic, do you want these? And Panasonic was like, sure, we'll put them in a GH2. Five Mark II, and make a little bit of money off of them, and, and that also allowed you know Panasonic to lower their price on a little bit, which is what they did, and that's because you know the sensor is it's a little bit cheaper. Now, another sensor that was exclusive to Olympus, which isn't in production anymore, it's the IMX one hundred nine, and of course it showed up in the first EM fives series and the earlier EM tens. That was a 16 megapixel camera. The IMX270, of course, was a 20 megapixel camera. Now, so this is the sensor that has shown up on Sony's charts, and everybody's chattering about this sensor. Okay, 
And for good reason, okay, there's actually a lot of neat things about this sensor that we look at it and we look at the characteristics and the performance and we're like, wow, this is like an IMX 270 just like on steroids, you know, and it really is, it's quite the sensor and we're going to go through some of the things that make it different. So the IMX 270 that Olympus currently uses is a front side illuminated sensor. And what that means is that the wiring is in between the lens, the micro lenses that are on the sensor and the actual sensing part of the camera sensor. And that, that wiring being in between, it essentially is almost like a neutral density filter that's built into the chip that absorbs some of the light, if you will. Which is unfortunate because that reduces quantum efficiency. And we know the quantum efficiency of the IMX270 is around 76%. That's, that's been calculated by a bunch of people online. And I think by for either photo labs or camera labs, one of those. Now, the newer sensor here, this IMX472, is a backside illuminated sensor, and it moves the photo um, dioid or the, the substrate that's sensitive to light up above all the wiring. And, and the way they do this, you're wondering, you probably to yourself, well, why does they just always do it this way? Well, the reason why is because you actually have to start manufacturing the sensor upside down, and then you have to flip it over. And doing that is, that's, that's pretty technically complicated when you're, you know, trying to produce one of these things on a wafer. So another interesting thing about this sensor is that based on the spec sheets of this thing, you know, it's not completely spelled out, but you know, it, it's giving me clues here that I believe, I suspect that this sensor has phase detect pixels on every single pixel, which is kind of neat. And as far as autofocus goes, that means that it would be very, it, it would be awesome as far as autofocus goes. It would be able to detect and track with a person's eye anywhere on frame. The older sensor, the IMX270, it had 120 sections that had these, these phase detect pixels on there. But if you think about it, if your eye moves from one group of phase detect pixels to another one, the camera might jump a little bit, okay, and, and kind of have to hunt when it transfers from one pocket to the next. Whereas this one here having phase detect pixels everywhere in the sensor, that means that you're going to get seamless transitions as a person's head moves around or moves forwards and backwards. So this, this is very exciting for autofocus. This, this could have great implications for computational photography and also just, you know, taking bird AI and face detect and train and card and all those detection um, algorithms that Olympus has built into the EM1X just, just to the next level. So the next thing that's kind of different about this sensor, and this is a big deal, is, is the fact that this is a stacked sensor. It's not a, uh, it's not one of the older traditional ones where all of the signal processing units are on the outside edges of the frame. And what's great about this is that it means that all of the ADCs, okay, can be mounted much closer to the actual pixel, and that means less noise. And it also means that they're not, you're not going to have issues with what's called amp glow. And a lot of times amp glow is something that would show up on the corners and it would look like this, almost like a light source in the camera, like something was polluting the image. And on the top here, I, I've kind of attached an image. This is a, this is a dark frame taken with a, an astrophotography camera that has amp glow. As you can see, it's got this really bright section. It's got these beams that are like, they, they go all the way across the frame sometimes. And, and that's that amp glow. And a stack sensor is, is virtually never going to have problems with this because those signal processing units are scattered all across the sensor rather than being condensed in one location. When you condense things into one location, you tend to produce more heat. And so, so a, a stack sensor is going to be a lower heat sensor, which, which is a good thing for astrophotography. You know, we pay attention to this more, so I think, than your, your daytime photographers do. But another really cool thing about it is that it means that incidental light, and there's light that's coming in at really extreme angles, okay, your, your sensor will be able to detect that better. And, and that's going to have good implications for lenses. It means that, you know, 
lens designers will have a little bit more forgiveness, so to speak, with uh, especially with wide angle lenses. And it'll make designing those kinds of lenses easier and it'll probably reduce it probably produces a sharper image as well. And then of course another really cool thing about this is you know we all know that Olympus is famous for its its image stabilization. They've got really good image stabilization. Well that that sensor it's it's in a frame that moves around based on these little, little magnets and stuff that then move it around. And with a stack sensor that sensor is essentially going to get smaller, even though the image sensing area is going to remain the same. And what's great about that is that means that that sensor is going to have more freedom to move around. And it'll be able to move farther than it could before. And what I'm predicting is that if Olympus uses a stack sensor in their next camera, there's obviously going to be a jump yet again in image stabilization capabilities. Now, these numbers right here, not all of these are like 100% solid numbers. These, these were just quick numbers that a couple of the guys on the forums were trying to, to calculate between the old sensor versus the new one. You know, um, I'm not, This is one I copy and pasted from one guy's comments, and I'm not sure where he got 1.7 times more pixels, but uh, he calculated about 20% more quantum efficiency. That means that the sensor, this sensor would detect about 20% more light. And then the saturation signal volume or per unit area would be 44% greater. So uh, you'd be able to almost over overexpose by almost a full stop more, I think, than you could before. And that means more dynamic range, you know. And that's, that, of course, is what he also talked about down here is a 12% dynamic range increase. Now, one other guy, he used a, a few other numbers, and he he used the, uh, the decibel level of the sensor to, to compare the two, and he got almost two stops improvement in dynamic range. But, you know, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle here. And then, of course, incidental light, because it's a stack sensor, it's going to have probably double the incidental light detection capabilities. And then the high speed rate of this new sensor, you know, it's about 2 times 4, 2.4 times faster than the last uh, sensor was. All right, now this, these are the actual data sheets of the IMX 472, and then the IMX 270 isn't on Sony's website, but there is an almost exact copy of it, the IMX272, it's, it's basically his twin brother. The only difference between the IMX272 and the IMX270 is that the 272 is an all pixel readout sensor, whereas the IMX270 has a rolling shutter function. So the 272 would have a little bit more noise than the 270 will. But the 272 is, is probably a little better for video because you don't get that rolling shutter thing going on. Although it's still fast, it almost doesn't matter at this point. But I've kind of on the right here though, I've kind of highlighted these are all in all of the pink boxes are things that are new. So this is a backside illuminated and stack CMOS sensor. Um, it's the same format. It's the same input frequency, which is good because that means that the electronics and stuff, the motherboard will be compatible with existing Olympus cameras. There won't be as much re-engineering to do. Um, it's an all pixel readout mode type sensor. So, you know, it reads the entire frame, which this is something that we can do now without increasing noise because we are working with a stacked sensor, by the way. And then each pixel readout mode has there's four different ways that this thing can read out the pixels. And and I haven't I've been researching actually these four right here trying to figure out exactly what all of them are, but uh, a lot of it has to do with binning, reading out normal mode, reading out phase difference, single pixel. I'm guessing single pixel would be on a bin one mode, and maybe normal mode would be in a bin mode where it'd be using two pixel groups or, or four pixels at, at a time, because this is a quad bear sensor by the way. And then the phase difference, of course, that's that's the autofocus sensors that are on every single pixel that I was talking about. And then of course HDR, this is a this is something that's kind of cool for the video guys. It essentially means that the camera will be able to take two pictures at the same time, just using different pixels at different gains, if you will. And so it'll essentially be able to create high definition or HDR video essentially. So if you're, if you're shooting at 30 frames per second, this camera is capable of taking 120 frames per second, 
So it's capable of taking four frames for every single actual video file that's recorded. So it can take four, stack them together, combine them, stick them in the video, takes four more, stacks them together, creates the next frame for the, the video at 30 frames per second. And then lastly down here, it's a 14-lane SLVSC EC output, which this has, we'll, we'll cover this a little bit more a little bit later, what that exactly means. But essentially, it means a lot faster data output, and it means that we can send more signals to the sensor back and forth, and we can communicate with, with it in more ways than we could in the past. And then, of course, the other thing, and I've already hinted at this, it's a quad Bayer structure RGB colors mosaic filter. So okay, let's kind of recap some of the differences between this sensor and the other one. It's a 60 frames per second sensor versus the new one is 120 frames per second. Now, now this one here is kind of important. This kind of gives us a good hint as to the ISO performance of this sensor. The old sensor was 24 decibels. The new one is 27. So what that tells us is it tells us that it has more dynamic range. But it also tells us that it could go to a higher ISO. I think right now we're limited to, what, 25,600 ISO, and we would be able to go to the next stop up, maybe even two, because of that higher decibel range. And then, of course, the old one was just a bear pattern, the new one the quad bear. And, and then I also show the difference in the actual sensing pixels in the sensor because there's actually a really minor difference in the height, just, just slightly, which I've got a feeling that Olympus would probably crop that in software or something like that. And then, of course, we have 12 lanes versus 14 lanes. The old sensor does have amp glow in it, but Olympus has written into their, their signal processing unit um, algorithms that kind of cancel it out. But with the new sensor, it won't need to do that. And so you, you'll get a little bit more ISO performance just because of that. And I, I just want to, I'm sorry, Ben, let me interrupt. I just want to make a quick note about decibels, like the 24 decibel versus 27 decibel. The, mm -hmm. uh, the decibel scale is logarithmic. So it, when you see 24 to 27, that's not like a 10% gain. You yeah. know, it could be 100%, 200%. I mean, it could be, it's some factor much greater than 10%, basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of sensitivity, I think is what that's referring to. So I just thought I'd throw that in. Yes, I had suspected that I just, I didn't actually have time to research that before we did this. <laughs> I'm glad you knew that. Yeah, it, so, it's it's a big it's a big difference um, on, on a scale. Like in practice, in real life, net net effect may not be 200%, but on a scale, in a perfect world, you know, the decibel scale is a logarithmic scale, and it goes up very quickly from one decibel to the next. Anyway, okay. Yeah, no, um, all right, so... And the last one down here, the readout noise of the sensor, uh, this is something I don't know yet. Okay, I don't know what it is. I know what the old sensor was. It was about, it was between 1.2 and 1.36 electrons per photon of light. I will tell you this, though, that all of the newer sensors that I've seen that use similar technologies to this one and that are in the same generational bracket, if you will, they're all about one electron or even less sometimes. So you expect that number to be lower, even though we don't really know exactly what it is, because we haven't seen this sensor in a camera yet. We can't measure it. All right, so let's clarify a little bit more here the differences between stacked and unstacked sensor. On the left here, we have an unstacked sensor. So if we think about this portion right here, this would be the sensor itself. In the old days with the unstacked sensors, we had to send that signal off of the sensor to the outside perimeter of it, where it went through noise reduction, okay? And then that signal was finally brought together and usually in one place or one part of the outside edge where the ADC, the analog digital converter, would convert that signal into a digital signal. And then it would be sent to the processing unit of the camera or finally written to your card. That was a lot of traveling as an analog signal, okay? And this is, this is why bigger sensors have traditionally had a lot more noise in them than, than the same generation sensor that was smaller as far as readout noise goes. is because it's got to go so much further and therefore it's picking up more photons of interference and so forth noise 
because it's in an analog form. This new stack technology, okay, there's an ADC underneath either each group of pixels or each individual pixel, okay? And that's great because that means that that pixel, that information, it's, it's right off of the silica and it goes straight to an ADC. It doesn't have to go very far. And because it doesn't have to go very far, it's much faster and it doesn't pick up any noise. You know, and, and we actually are able to do two steps of noise reduction to it. We're able to do a step of noise reduction to it right before it gets to the ADC, and then one at, right after it leaves the ADC, and it's converted into a digital signal. And once it's converted into a digital signal, it, it doesn't pick up any more noise. And then it can be sent as far as we want, and we're not going to uh, see any issues there because it's, it's, you know, it's a digital signal now. And also, this type of sensor, the stack sensor, yeah, they're way, way faster, okay? They're just way faster. Now, now this quad bear technology, which I, you're going to see this more and more. I, I think every single cell phone sensor that has been proposed in the last two years has either been a quad or, or sexto or, or more bear pattern, okay? So some of them are nine by nine groups of pixels that are, that are bared together. But anyways... What's interesting about this quad bear technology is it allows you to read the pixel out in two different ways so that you can either have a high resolution or a low resolution. Now, this is something that CCD sensors used to be able to do at any scale. We could do a bin one, two, three, four, five, even nine bin of pixels. We could bin nine pixels by nine pixels together with a CCD, no problem. That was just an inherent thing in the, in the sensor itself, just the way that it was wired. CMOS sensors, we can't really do that. However, because of this new stack technology and also this quad bear system, we can put ADCs right at the pixels now. And so now we can actually build architecture in the sensor that allows us to bend pixels together and to get not exactly like a CCD, but similar a similar effect where we can combine pixels together and thus create a larger well, a larger light bucket, if you will, and so, you know, make a brighter image. And, and that, that's kind of echoed down here with this image right here. It's, you know, we're working at zero gain, yet we've got a fully exposed image. Now over here, this guy right here, it has been run, each individual pixel has been read out, and as a result, it's a little bit darker. But, but this is also cool because, you know, there's a, there's a third way we can read this out, and that's where we read them out in groups of two, okay? And with these groups of two, we can actually do kind of like an HDR almost hyper hyperdynamic range where we can actually change the sensitivity of the sensor while video footage is even being taken. So this, this could act like a, a built-in neutral density filter while the camera is taking video. And so and that's something that, you know, <laughs> dedicated big honking, you know, 60-pound video cameras have been able to do for a long time because they had hardware they could do it. Now we can do it right in the sensor, and we can do this in tiny little cameras now. You know, and it means that we can apply this uh, neutral density filter without changing the aperture, without changing the focus, without changing the shutter speed. And, and then this is one more slide. I'm, I'm just trying to kind of simplify, if you will, how the bear pattern works. You know, in its normal mode. You know, it's just going to read off the groups of four as if they were one great big pixel. And so you just get more information. Whereas down here at the bottom, if we split all the pixels up, we can kind of reinterpolate them using software and then create essentially a higher resolution image. Now, okay, so the IMX 472, is it going to show up on Olympus camera? My thinking, okay, this is, this is this is me estimating here, is that this is not the sensor that is going to show up in a new Olympus camera. Uh, I hope none of you are crying right now. <laughs> but don't worry, okay, there's good news with this, okay. So this sensor, it's been listed on Olympus's website. I mean, I'm sorry, not on Olympus, but on Sony's website, which means that anybody can buy this sensor now. So I don't think this is a sensor that Olympus is going to be using because well, they don't get exclusive rights to it. So when we were talking earlier about how you wouldn't want to design a sensor, go through all the work of, you know, 
designing a really good sensor that's well balanced, that has all the features that would work really good for photography, come out with a camera for it, and then Joe Schmo in another country quickly does some R and D and throws together a half done camera for half the price of yours with the same sensor in it. Okay. You want that exclusivity, okay? Yeah. All the manufacturers, you know, if they get a latest generation type pixel or sensor, usually they all try to get this exclusivity deal, at least for a period of time. So the fact that the sensor is out there and available to buy right now, and we don't even see Olympus camera out there with the sensor in it, probably means that it was either done for somebody else Although I kind of find that hard to believe too. I, I really do think that this sensor was being worked on for Olympus, but I think it was when Olympus was owned by Olympus Medical. Because we look at all the characteristics of this sensor, this IMX472, and it's a sensor that's designed for pictures. Okay. Yes, it's got some video characteristics in it, but it really is a picture a, a sensor that's designed for pictures. It's not designed for video. Okay. If we did do video for it, we have to downsample it or upsample it or something like that. And that's just not the way you approach video. Okay. In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, okay, when JIP owned Olympus, they probably terminated this contract. If, if they did have a contract for the sensor, who knows? It could have been somebody else. Or, um, uh, and they're working on something completely different that, well, not completely different, probably somewhat similar to this. But it's going to be a sensor that will work well with one of the existing uh, video formats. Because we know that JIP, who, who now owns Olympus OM Digital Solutions, is concentrating on video, which I think is a good thing. Okay. Now, don't despair. Like, there's, a, there's really a ton of sensors out there right now. There's this one here. This one just kind of randomly popped up out of nowhere. It's a 33 megapixel sensor. It's not quite tall enough to be a fourth third sensor, but it actually has, um, let me get my fingers on the, on the flame here. <laughs> it, has a, it has a field of view that's similar to a four thirds camera. It's, it uses the same image circle in other words. Okay. But it, it's got some things that are great about it and some things that aren't great about it. You know, it is an 8K video camera and that's kind of where things are eventually going to go. But you know it's it's only eight bit I think at eight K. You know, it's ten bit at four K though. So I, I don't really see this camera ever being used in Olympus camera. Maybe if we had a later generation of sensors down the road, we might see something similar to this in Olympus camera. We shall see. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I'm, go, go, ahead. go back to that slide real quick before. <laughs> you, you were talking about this because this this camera's bit was shown by I think Jimmy Chang. Yes as a model but when i looked at the sensor size when you were talking about that it's 18.8 .8 by 10.6 but currently the sensors tall. and our cameras are 17 by 13. yes yeah so it's it's three millimeters shorter so it's a tiny bit wider yeah and a tiny yeah. bit wider so it yeah. seems more 16 by 9 ish than four by well anyway um well, but it, I, is, it is a 16 by 9 yeah yeah so it this this sensor is totally video. Yeah, you know it's it's not designed for photography. Um, I doubt it has any phase to take pixels on it. Right, right. Okay, I'll let you go. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, we're almost done here. So another sensor that's kind of out there on the horizon, and, and and this one seems like kind of a more incremental evolution, if you will. So it's a twenty-four megapixel sensor based on the video codec that they say it's going to work with. They, they, they said it will be 5.7K capable. And in order to be 5.7K capable, some guys online, they did the, the math for it in a four-thirds format, you know, interpolated from a, a 16 by 9. That's going to equal about 24 megapixels. And it's going to have about 3 micron pixels. So they're a little bit smaller. That means a little bit less light per pixel. But, you know, today's sensors are just, they're way more sensitive and they have less noise. So that's okay. 12-bit uh, probably. That's my guess. It will definitely be a backside illuminated sensor. You actually can't get front side illuminated sensors anymore. Oh, Sony has shut that, that section of their factory down. 
And it will probably be a stack sensor. I, I think, I don't see why they, they wouldn't get a stack sensor, especially if they're putting it into their GH6, it's their flagship camera, for crying out loud. Uh, now let's talk about a couple more technologies, though, that are on the horizon. And, and this is one of the things where I warn photographers is, you know, don't tell your customers that the reason why you're a professional photographer is because you can produce this beautiful bouquet in shallow depth of field. Don't do that, okay? You are asking for trouble because here's the thing. These new cell phones that are coming out can artificially do that. And I know Apple's come out with a new LiDAR system, which is where it actually sends uh, rays of light out in, in the rays of light that are beyond the visible spectrum so they don't interfere with the photo at all. But they bounce off the things in the room, they come back, and it tells the camera how far things are and, and where in the camera. And it can use this technology to actually pick a spot where everything should be sharp and then blur everything that's in front of it or behind it and so create an artificial depth of field. And and we're actually, now that, that particular one that's in the iPhone, it, it's a separate chip, okay? It's a separate sensor. Sony is working on being able to do this right on the sensor itself, which means that any lens you put on there will work with this. So if you put on an 800 millimeter focal length, you're still going to have this ability to detect the depth in the scene. If you put a 16 millimeter fisheye on there, you'll still be able to detect the depth of the scene all the way to the corner. And it, it's technology; it's getting better. It's it's a little bit in its infancy, but you know this is why I warn people: it's like don't depend on having shallow depth of field. I know, I know, Mr. Tony over there on his channel, he's all about that. Well, guess what? People with their cell phones are going to be like, I can do that on my cell phone. Why am I paying you all this money to do my photos? So, so, so don't do that. You know, that's, you know, concentrate on good photography, <laughs> but, but this is kind of, you know, new technology that's out there that, that you can expect to see in a, in a camera. And, and this is where like, you know, we as Olympus guys, even if you have a, one of the cheaper, more inexpensive lenses, Olympus might be able to harness this technology, this technology in, in a future camera and be able to artificially create like shallower depth of field using, using this LIDAR type technology, if you will. Uh, now, this is something that I hinted at a little bit earlier, this SLVS EC, um, the 14 lanes that the sensor, this IMX472 has versus the 12 that it had before. And with having more lanes and, and this SLVS EC technology, that means that this camera can do a lot of neat things. Like it can actually capture uh, sections of video in different parts of the frame, if you will, at maybe different frame rates or even different like uh, <laughs> even di even different uh, ISOs and so forth, which which is kind of cool if you think about it. You know that would uh, that, come to think of it just right now. That actually has some astrophotography implications. We could actually dedicate a section, maybe a strip of the sensor. That will watch the stars and how it moves, and then actually move the sensor around to kind of follow the stars, if you will. But then that's an astrophotography thing. But for like you daytime people, it means that you could actually take pictures while you're in the middle of shooting video, okay, and save like a full resolution um, still while you're capturing, you know, an HD movie or even a 4K movie for that matter. And then, and then this is another type of technology that. It's interesting because this technology used to be in cameras and then it was removed <laughs> because, you know, we didn't have the ability to scale these uh, prisms down. But uh, this is this is the problem with the bear pattern, okay? And and we're kind of actually going to end up where we were at the very beginning of this, this slideshow. So here we were talking about the read noise versus the shot noise. So the shot noise is, you know, it's everything above the sensor, okay? Today's sensors can detect... 90% of the light hitting them. Well, that's without the bear pattern. Okay, that measurement is done without the bear pattern in there. You throw the bear pattern in there, and your sensor, it's split up, because, you know, by nature, pixels are, are black and white colorblind. The way we get color out of a sensor is we have this bear pattern over the sensor, and we, we block certain types of light to each pixel, and from that we can interpolate and basically create a color picture. What that means is that four of the pixels on the sensor here in this, in this particular example that I have here, the red ones, are going to reject 
75% of the light. You know, or, or I, I'm sorry, right, let me read this. 25% of the pixels on the sensor will be used for red light. 25% of the pixels on the sensor will be used for blue light. And 50% of the pixels will be used for green. So that means you're throwing out 75% of the surface area of your sensor for blue light. And 75% of your surface area for red. And 50% of the surface area for green. So essentially, the absolute best quantum efficiency that you could ever possibly get with a Bayer pattern type sensor, you know, once once we include the Bayer pattern into our quantum efficiency calculation, the absolute best we could get is 50%, because at that time we're only using half the surface of the sensor. Now, there was in the olden days, okay, these things called three chip video cameras, okay? And I envision this coming back into sensors someday. What a three chip video camera was, is you, ha you had your object with gave, gave off its light and then it went through the lens and then it went through this prism, okay? And this prism would actually divide the light into its three wavelengths. And so you'd have 33% of your light would go to the red, 33% of your light would go to the green sensor, and 33% of your light would go to the blue sensor. And then from that, you would able to be able to use basically 100% of the light coming into the camera and create a color image. So it, this is a, this is a pretty credible way to think about it. This this could cause camera sensors on a quantum efficiency or shot noise status. Okay, that would reduce shot noise by a factor of two, two stops essentially. Now, do I see this technology coming into a sensor recently? No, and it probably maybe ten years from now. We'll see. But they have to if if they were to ever kind of implement this. They would need to downsize these prisms enough so that they could cover each pixel. Now, the cool thing, though, is that because the bare pattern is inherently, it kind of blurs the image, with a three-chip type CC, or CMOS sensor, if you will, that had these prisms built into each pixel, you actually wouldn't need as many pixels okay, to get the same resolution. In other words, you would only need a five megapixel sensor with these prisms in it to reach the same level of detail in a 20 megapixel Bayer pattern sensor. So that would mean that your pixels could get very big. Okay? You could have very good low light performance, very low noise, and at the same time would still be very sharp. And and that, that's kind of the end of my presentation. That's we're kind of picking up where we left off, you know, like the the shot noise, everyone kind of thinks that shot noise is as low as we're going to possibly get it. I don't want to say no, they're wrong. It can be made lower, and that's we just need to figure out a way to get around the bear pattern, essentially, and start using 100% of the light that reaches the sensor. And then the read noise down here, there's still lots of ways to to reduce that read noise. Um, I know I've actually seen some Sony sensors, the very small ones, have read out noise that's like less than half of an electron per photon of light, which, which is just insanely slow. So read noise is going to continue um, getting getting lower and lower, which means we'll be able to use higher and higher ISOs before we see noise. But, uh, but also the shot noise, everything that happens above the sensor, that's not really going to change much in the future un until they somehow get rid of the bear pattern. So, whew. I'll okay, get that. Take, take a breath. Take a breath. Uh, so, if anyone has any questions, uh, you know, start putting your questions together, and I'll try and get them to Ben on the screen for everybody to see. Uh, let me go ahead and rearrange the screen. And, whoops. I lost Ben. Here he comes. Okay. All right, we're back. Um, and but yeah, that I I know that was a lot of information for everyone, and it it this is actually my second time seeing the presentation, but it's still sinking in, you know. Uh, but I just had a couple of quick questions that I saw in the in the chat. 
that I think um, we could probably elaborate on a little bit because these these are the buzzwords in the sensor tech, right? Is uh, BSI and stack sensor. Yeah, those are the two big buzzwords. And uh, let me, I'm sorry, I need to do one more thing. Oh, Jeff here made a good point. So every three decibels is doubled. Right, right. Doubling. Um, thank you, Jeff, for that comment. Yeah, so. so essentially, yeah, that, that sensor is double the sensitivity. Right, exactly. <laughs> sorry for Rob's questions. <laughs> 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 These guys always kill me, but um, you know the the uh, the BSI the what when you were talking about that what struck me was uh, you know now that because we were looking at a cross section of the sensor right yes uh -huh. um, if you could bring that slide up for me so I just wanted to. It kills me. It's, it's such a great community here, you know. All right, let's go back to. This oh, one more, one more, yeah, there one more. Yeah, this one here. Mm -hmm. So specifically, the right now chips are made on a wafer of yes. silicon. And then normally what they do is they layer the electronics on top of the silicon. And then on top of the electronics, they put the lenses, these micro lenses. Uh, so the, the, the BSI is now moving the wiring underneath the silicon and then putting the lenses on top. And I think that's why uh, these, these kinds of sensors cost more because now we're doing double-sided type processing on a single wafer. Yeah, flipping but, a wafer is, like I said, I think earlier, it's not easy to do. You know, you can't just yeah. flip something. It's, a, it's like taking a pie that's not cooked in the oven trying to flip it. Exactly. <laughs> All the ingredients are going to come out. <laughs> exactly. And that, and I, yeah, so it's not a big, it's a big deal because they have to make sure that both sides of the wafer are now, you know, being, you know, processed, right? Being mm -hmm. able to, they got to remain exactly flat. Um, yeah. I think what they do is they put a substrate over the entire thing and then flip it over, and then they have to eat away the substrate and then kind of start right. over again. It adds more time to the process, essentially. Exactly. And, you know, so that that's the main, you know, that sort of drives it why, you know, larger, you know, larger sensors may have taken a little more time to get this BSI technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, versus like cell phones and tiny cameras, right? Pocket cameras have had this BSI tech for years now. Yeah, more than 10 years. Um, and the other significant thing uh, that I noticed was that when you talked about incident light, uh, if you could explain a little bit why the BSI sensor is better at incident light um, than say, you know, a regular sensors. It's because all of the all the sensitive stuff is is stacked closer to the actual um, color filter color filters. Mm -hmm. There's no with a non-stacked front side illuminated sensor. There's a little bit of a gap between the bare pattern and those micro lenses, and so because of that little bit of gap, if you have incidental light, it can it can hit the wall, so to speak, of that well before it, it gets down into the actual silica okay. itself. The illustrations that I had from Sony, they weren't, they're were they not that great explaining this. They, they actually don't show it quite the way it actually is in real life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. One other fun thing about these micro lenses, and this is where we could, because right now everybody's kind of stuck at about 90% quantum efficiency. Mm -hmm. You might see it jump to about 95 when somebody figures out how to make a micro lens that we can kind of cut out square, so that way it would go all the way to the corners of the pixel. Right now they're round, so when you have a round hole in a square peg, you know you, you lose a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, but that that's something that else is going to come next is, is people will figure out how to cut out square micro lenses that will have that the correct surface sphere right. to it and be able to stick it in there, and then and then we'll have as close to 100% quantum efficiency as you can possibly get with the bare pattern. Right. 
And then go to the slide about the uh, uh, stack sensors. I know you numbered the slides, but I'm totally, I totally didn't follow my own rules. <laughs> oh, I think it's this one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, the next, next one. After oh, this, oh, yes, this one. Another one. Oh, one more. Huh. Okay. Well, basically, the question was Was it this one? Yeah, this one here. The question, it was from Camille, Camille but from earlier, uh, you know, because intuitively I had the same question before I asked you before the stream was about, you know, wouldn't a stack sensor have a negative effect uh, on, you know, the, the noise or light gathering ability? Because somebody was saying that, or Camille was saying that the A9 had didn't have as good as a quantum efficiency, say, as an A7 III. And an A7 III is a 24 megapixel full frame in case. Mm -hmm. And the A9 is, I think, a 20 megapixel full frame. But, uh, you know, I think the stack sensor design, basically, you were saying that how the, the, the analog signal has to travel further down some, some wires Mm -hmm. before it gets converted by the ADC. Yeah, because that, that ADC that, is off sensor, actually. Right. And that that while it's traveling that distance, it, it picks up more noise along the way. Mm -hmm. Right. And then a stack sensor, that path from analog to the ADC is is much shorter. I mean it's already on the sensor. So there's virtually no additional noise picked up with a stack sensor. Is that does that sound right? Yes, yes, and I think that might be why those two Sony cameras are a little different is because if one of them is a rolling shutter versus the other one is a, you know, it takes a picture of the entire frame and moves it off, when you take a picture of the entire frame and move it off with a non-stack sensor, the, the information from different parts of the frame have to go further in order to get to one location, whereas if you're doing... Uh, a rolling shutter where you're reading it off in strips, the mm -hmm. distance that the the analog signal has to go is is a little bit shorter than, and that's why you know the rolling shutter was you know it traditionally had less noise in it, but now that we have this stack technology, it, it kind of gets around that because now we can do it directly right there at the ship. It doesn't have to go anywhere. Right, right, um, and then Walter had a question. Uh, here, this one here. Does Ben have any thoughts on whether the Fovian could be reappear and be further developed? If you're familiar with that sensor at all, I don't know. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm, f I'm familiar. Okay. And then, oh, so, before you start, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, I got another comment that your mic is still too hot. Maybe turn it down to 25%. Sure. Yeah, Lars, we we tried to adjust the the sound before we started, but I of course it could be like while I'm presenting, I get more excited and I talk louder. Yeah, actually, twenty five percent is too low. Okay, I'm sorry. Do thirty, and we'll leave, we'll leave it there and keep going. <laughs> All right, how, how's that? Okay, it, it sounds okay to me, but um, All right, let's, so, uh, let's so, just go from here. Go yeah. ahead. So Walter, so what what Fovion did with their with their technology, and it is it is pretty cool because like I think the first sensor they came out with was a two point seven megapixel sensor, but it had the resolution of a much higher megapixel count camera, you know, which was kind of neat, and then we understood why that was, and that's well, it's not using the beta pattern; it's every single pixel is reading all three wavelengths of light. Now, they've had traditionally very bad quantum efficiency, though, and that's because essentially you had a filter, and then you had silica, and then you had another filter, and then you had silica, and so forth. And each filter the light went through, some of that light would get absorbed because they were absorptive type filters and not reflective. See, the, the prism that I was talking about in those little three-chip video cameras that's a reflective type filter 
where it allows through all the all of specific wavelengths and it reflects only certain wavelengths and and that's a much more efficient way and even even in astronomy like the filters that we buy there, there's to this day there's two different types that you can buy you can buy the visual ones which are absorptive they absorb all the wavelengths that you don't want and then you have the reflective type filters that they reflect the light that you don't want and they only allow through the light that you do want and the foveum technology unfortunately what they were using is 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 rather inefficient um, absorptive type filters to kind of filter that light all through the same pixel, so to speak, and then trying to split that off using the three different layers of the technology. I, it'd be nice if I had a graph here to, to kind of explain this by, but yeah, but with foveum technology, it's it's neat technology. It's it's not quite done the right way. I I think that the way it was done with the three chip cameras you know that's the way to go they just need to figure out how to get that prism small enough to cover you know one small pixel versus an entire sensor which is the way it used to be done mm, wow yeah i all i remember about foveon sensors is you know they they were great at base iso but as soon as you started to add any gain but it kind of makes sense now because you were saying that they actually it's a three layer instead of just that one layer Mm -hmm. uh, so you lose so much light, but the read noise is still the same, <laughs> yeah. or three mm -hmm. times as much because you got three layers. I'm mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, guessing. But yeah, it, it wasn't like if we go back to the very first slide of my presentation, it it was just a shot noise heavy sensor, not a read noise heavy sensor. Like it didn't have problems with read noise; it was the shot noise because you weren't getting as much light to the sensor. Yeah, and then Walter had one more quick question about a stack cell, uh, stack sensor. I'm sorry. Is there an AC directly attached below and dedicated to each sensor cell? Oh, man, I, I don't know. That's that's one I'd have to look up. Yeah, I, I would suspect such. Um, if you had one ADC reading off. Well, actually, you know what? I'm going to say that there's just one ADC because being Fulvian's an older technology, they weren't doing stack sensors back then. So I can almost guarantee you that ADC was off chip. And so all that uh, information was being read as an analog signal and then sent to a noise, noise processing unit and then sent to an off chip um, ADC where it would be, then be converted into an, into a, an actual digital signal. Okay. Does that answer his question? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I sometimes I picture like an ADC per row, maybe not necessarily per pixel, but um, yeah, it's, it's still a little beyond me a little bit. Okay. Let's see. There's one here from Christine. Oh, I like How the profile you... picture. Uh, in addition to big thank you, how do you judge the potential for improvements in the ADC area? Increase the number of per pixel. Any other ideas? Um, yeah, it was, it's, it's sort of like how I covered these dual gain cameras. I mean, soon we're gonna, you're going to see triple gain cameras and then quad gain, gain cameras because the more the ADC can be designed and tuned specifically to work well at a specific gain because because you're hitting it with more voltage i believe and that increased voltage you know if you have a big adc okay well it's going to take a lot of voltage very well if you have a small adc it's not going to take a lot of voltage very well but it might be really sensitive to all the fine um the fine variations in gradient and so forth so yeah i, I think more ADCs per pixel is kind of the future. That's eventually, I think I even hinted in this in the presentation that eventually you'll have an ADC for every single ISO, or at oh. least four or five of them. You know, eventually that's yeah that's going to take years to materialize. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking maybe ten to twenty years from now um, before we see an ADC for every single ISO. Of course, we're probably yeah. going to have more ISO options too. Right, and you got to balance battery life and all of that, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, but okay, this this is I don't I, if you're familiar with Fuji uh, cameras at all. There's a question here. 
Ah, uh, the trans sensor. I'm sorry, man. I have not researched that one at all. Okay. I have heard about it, but uh, I know from from what I've seen said about it, it's not like an earth shattering type technology. I know it's kind of like when Olympus had their their live moss sensors. Okay, that was marketing bull crap. <laughs> they were just sea moss sensors. <laughs> Yeah, they just called it something different, and that that might very well be what Fuji is doing. You know, this it's just it's the same technology that Sony's using. They're just calling it something else. Yeah, and all I know about it is that you know the you know we have the Bayer sense or Bayer array on top of the sensor, but the Fuji X Trans sensor has a different array, right? There's like twice as many reds as there are blue and green versus the bear you were showing had twice as much green as blue and red. Oh, but okay. Yeah, it's it's not something I'm familiar with either. Uh, it's well, just that, one of that would make it more red light sensitive. Yeah. Um, I want like the ideal sensor is one that you could split off each wavelength of light into its own little component. Right. Okay, and then um, this is up for slide number five. So if you can pull up that. Yeah. And the question is, does why does the full well capacity go from 14 to 66 in bin two? Shouldn't it be 56? So is there some multiplication problem here or is there some other reason for it being more than four times? All right, so that's basically, yeah, so the dynamic range of the sensor, it's, it's just the dynamic range of the sensor. You can't really, I think I see what he's talking about there. Basically, when it's going to the new ADC, you'll see that the, the dynamic range, it goes back up to 13 stops. You know, it's never going to go above that level. If that makes sense, because because if it did, there would be no point in putting the first ADC in there in the in the first place. Does that kind of make sense? I, because like, ah, uh, how can I explain this? So like, you can't really get more dynamic range other than what's actually detected in the first place, I guess, because this this ADC at one twenty gain. You know, it's it's applying more voltage to it, but it's mm -hmm. able to do it without without doubling the current in the actual photosite, so to speak. Um, right, right. Like, I, I don't I don't think I'm explaining this quite right. Of course, this isn't something I rehearsed either. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it can't go applying a different ADC. You're never going to go higher than than the base dynamic range. Right, because the the question was, I think, because he he's seeing the noise drops by a factor of four, but the dynamic range doesn't go up by a factor of four. Is is I think what he's asking. Well, he was he was talking about the well capacity was fourteen k versus sixty six k. Oh, is that what he's talking about? So, yeah, yeah. So the well capacity is is more than four times. 14 right four times 14 is uh oh I, I never noticed that that is these are just numbers that i pulled from zwo and also sony's website so yes. why it goes up more than four hmm, let I me know. four let me just do the math 14 times four it should be 56 it's 56 so the question is why yeah. why is it 66k instead of 40 14 instead okay. of exactly yeah, sorry, sorry, man. We, we were answering your question totally the wrong way. <laughs> right. Um, right. All right. So yeah, why the full well is deeper than four times? Um. Okay. This this is where this is what I think it might be. Is you've got your your. Let's go to another slide here. So. Uh, let's go to this this one right here. So. Let's look at these pixels here, on the top left example. So you've got. Let's say we're bending these four pixels together. 
Now, individually, if we were reading these pixels individually, we're just going to get, let's say, the green that is inside this square black box, okay? But when we combine all four of them together, see those black lines that are here that divide the pixels? That's not there anymore. So that right there might be where it's actually picking up just a tiny bit more capacity because it's essentially ignoring these gates that are in between the silica. So I think that is where that, that anomaly is coming from. Or it's a math error by Sony, which I doubt. <laughs> okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Just, just the way they, they separate the Bayer pattern is what I'm getting. Um, here's a question from Ed. Upping the antes a bit, where do the standard sensors change between photo bodies and the astro bodies? Ali versus ZWO as a comparison. The sensors themselves are equal. So what makes the, I guess, the astro sensors more sensitive? Uh, the cooling. That's it. It's mainly yeah. the cooling. Okay. Yeah. We'll go back to... So these guys, they have... Really, all of them, the Orion one, the uh, the Altair camera, and the ZWOs. You can see them pretty well. This black grate that you see on the side, that's basically, there's a Peltier cooler attached directly to the sensor. And that Peltier cooler pulls heat off the sensor and dumps it into that, that heat sink, if you will. And then there's a fan in the very back that, that pushes air across it, so to speak. And... Basically, it cools the sensor. Um, what that does, it doesn't increase the sensitivity of the sensor. What it does is it decreases the, um, the amount of electrical noise. And actually, I just read a really, really good example of this in, in one of my books this morning. I'm going to get this out and read it. It was so good. So this is the Kodak KF8300 sensor, which is actually a four-thirds, eight-megapixel sensor. Um, on a warm summer evening at 25 degrees Celsius, the sensor's photosites will each produce about around 2.5 electrons per second of noise. All, for a five minute exposure, that would equal about 750 electrons of light of noise. That's gonna build up actually in the image, okay? Each photosite has a well capacity of about 25,000 electrons. So almost 3% of the capacity of the sensor is now being taken up by the noise. Cooling the chip by 30 degrees Celsius is going to drop the thermal signal to about 25 electrons. So you're going from 750 electrons to 25 electrons. So basically what that does is that leaves you more room in the pixel to detect actual light rather than having uh, noise build up. And, and a little bit earlier here, he gives an example. He says, cooling a sensor 30 degrees Celsius below the ambient temperature reduces thermal signal by about 97%. So that particular type of noise, thermal noise, is reduced by 97% by reducing the temperature 30 degrees Celsius. Okay. So it's it's more about not the sensor itself, but all the hardware around it to cool it off. Yeah. As I was saying, somebody and I know you do this or working on it is uh, you you're developing coolers that we can attach to our Olympus cameras to yeah. cool the sensor, right? Yes, yes, yeah. I, maybe tomorrow I will be able to get on the CNC machine and start milling those out. I have almost all the components I need. Yeah. To do it. Somebody was actually going to make one for Canon because the Canon, I think it was the R6 or something like that, had these overheating issues. Mm -hmm. They were going to charge 12000 bucks for this cooler. <laughs> wow. Attached to the back of your camera. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. They, their store still doesn't show it for sale. So I, I don't think that they ever really materialized that idea. Yeah. Yeah. This was the comment that I was referring to. Um, yeah, I'd only need to sell two uh, fans for twelve thousand each, and I'd I'd be good for a couple of years. Yeah, trust me, I will not charge that much. 
<laughs> for mine. <laughs> okay. Uh, any, any other questions for um, uh, Ben? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. My brain is like full now. I've had to push your name out to take in some of this. Uh, so put your questions together, but I just, I, you know, th this is why I haven't done like a video about the next sensor or camera that's coming out from Olympus because it, it would just be an uneducated guess. And that's why I wanted to have you on to, to help my viewers understand uh, basically about sensor technology, what's on the shelf now mm -hmm. and why the sensor you think that's going to go into the next camera is not even publicly yeah. seen. It's not in, in public domain yet. Yeah. Chris has got a really good question. Uh, Chris M. Oh, okay. You does mean Christine? This... Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Christine. <laughs> okay. um, does all this mean that we can expect rather improvements in movies, the movie area, rather than pure photography area of consumers? So, so this is what I would have to say about that, is that any improvements that are made in the video world are going to trickle down into the photography world. That, that is a guarantee. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the two are so mutually exclusive to each other. Um, and if you can think about like the first satellites that NASA sent to Jupiter and out into the outer reaches of our solar system, those were video cameras. They weren't, they weren't cameras. <laughs> really? Yes. Yes. Huh. They were, they were TV cameras actually. They just retrofitted some TV cameras, threw them on the Voyager one and two, and and the Pioneer, I think it was, and that's that's what they used to take those images. So huh. video and photos, they are they're twins. Okay, they they're as close a twin as you can get. Okay. Here, I gotta plug in because my son unplugged me again. Oh, okay. Um, there we go. We're charging again. Anyone and else I have think, any questions? Yeah, I I think uh, your presentation was awesome, Ben. I, I don't want to keep you too long. We've been on. Uh, I guess uh, I can I can sum this all up saying that like what we've seen this this new IMX four seventy two sensor. I can guarantee you that what Olympus has planned is going to be better than that. Wow. Okay, I, I can guarantee you that. So it, it, it's already a, a cool sensor. I mean, yeah, it was a lot of camera with that sensor in it. But uh, but I can guarantee you that whatever Olympus has planned, it will be better than that. Wow. So, wow. Because yeah, that sensor. You know, the what what caught my eye. You know, besides all the BSI stack stuff, was you know the the autofocusing, the phase detect. Oh yeah, that's gonna be cool. That is gonna be and, so cool. You know, I, I wonder if they're going to need to use a new TruePix CPU to drive this sensor. Um, Probably. Yeah, and, and another thing that caught my eye was, you know, how it uses the same clock frequency at 72 hertz. Mm -hmm. um, and you were saying they don't have to design or redesign or re-engineer the other components that rely on a clock. Yeah, the, the interface will be, they're going to be using the same hookups. Right, and yeah. I think... Um, you know, I really hope they, they put a fast processor in this next camera, and I think that they will be able to do it because because Chip also owns Sony Vio, or what used to be Sony Vio, um, right. laptops. So so they right. these guys that own this company, you know, they they're in the processor industry. Yeah, you know, they yeah, the and, industry. And JIP also owns a uh, part of Hitachi, yep. <laughs> believe it or not, which has their own fabrication plants and. But anyhow, that that's all speculation. Uh, but you know, from what I know about clocks, the re the reason that caught my attention because that seems like such a minuscule thing, right? Mm -hmm. Seventy-two megahertz, right? <laughs> What's the big deal with that? But the reason it caught my attention because I know in 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 analog digital converters, like in music, you know, these these uh, when people are streaming music and they talk about bit rates and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, the, and and the reason some you know you can buy these like twenty dollar you know uh, streaming boxes, but the sound quality is not so great sometimes. Yeah, and people say, well, it's all digital. Why does it make any difference? You know, the the sound quality if everything is digital. And what I learned was that the clock, 
rate, not the rate, but the clock, the timing, it's extremely important to getting the best digital signal. Because mm -hmm. with a poor digital signal, uh, you start running into like error correction and things like that. Yeah. And they they said that it's very important to have a very uh, accurate clock. And uh, so I'm assuming that the hardware that they've developed up to this point, they have excellent, you know, accurate clocks, which is going to help with everything digital in the camera. I mean, that's, I mean, we're really getting into the weeds here about things, but that just, you know, I'm sure like with our viewers, little things that you've talked about today uh, strike strike different points about why the sensor is going to be almost like a leap in technology uh, with all of these compared to our current 20 megapixel sensor, not necessarily oh. against everything that's out there. Um, yeah, because that sensor is five years old, and and really it's it's probably six or seven years old because it was probably designed two years before Olympus used it in the first camera. Right, right. You know, it 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 came in right before backside illumination was a big deal, so it, it's kind of one of the reasons why you know Olympus came out with it and it was a great camera, and then it was quickly eclipsed because a new technology came out right after they they came out yeah. with that sensor. Yeah, and I also so, remember that. When BSI came out and people were talking about it, you know, the, the explanation companies were giving at the time, camera companies, about why they're not using a BSI sensor is because the difference in light performance was negligible between BSI and non-BSI at the time mm -hmm. because, you know, we were talking about like 10 megapixel full frame sensors and the wiring was so tiny relative to the pixel size that it didn't really interfere with the light path. Yeah, but now um, that we've got more pixels and they're really yeah, tightly packed on there, you need it. Right, now the wiring is a little bit more significant impact, right? Because the wires mm -hmm. are bigger relative to every pixel. So, I mean, there's lots of little nitty gritty things that we get into, but I think, you know, you explained a lot of information there. And I'm, <laughs> I'd have to rewatch this a couple times myself to kind of even get a, like I said, my brain's on overload. <laughs> so anyhow, um, I want to thank you, uh, Ben, for coming in today and, and really giving us this presentation, explaining everything. Uh, and I, I really encourage everyone to go to Ben's channel for, uh, he talks about astrophotography, but he does have several videos that I think would be relevant no matter what kind of photography you do. Uh, particularly with um, when he does the lens reviews, because even though the lens reviews are for more astrophotography based, uh, he brings up a lot of points that would affect any other kind of photography that we do, like uh, chromatic aberrations, different f-stops. Um, and uh, but if you are into astrophotography, you know he has some excellent tutorials there, and I really liked his uh, moon video. Uh, how to, you know, an easy, easy way to shoot the moon. That was really interesting. I never thought about just recording 4K video uh, and then stacking it that way. It's very interesting. So there's a lot of things going on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the video is over, I'll put links down to your social media. So you have your Instagram and um, your channel. Did you have any other social media that you use uh, regularly? No, not really. I mean, those are... Okay. Kind of the two big ones. I'm not on TikTok or anything else like that yet. Yeah, <laughs> but you 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 do post on Facebook a lot as well. I do. And, and the OMD astrophotography. Yeah, yeah, I'm on there all the time. So I'll put I'll put a link to the OMD astrophotography Olympus astrophotography uh, page as well, and you can catch Ben there if you have any other questions. That's an easy place to catch him. <laughs> and there's a so, lot of guys on there. They're doing some incredible stuff. There's yeah, there's a few guys. That, they're doing way better stuff than I can do, but but they also have modified cameras. Yeah, I've never modified mine. Yeah, yeah. I I actually someone sent me a modified camera that I need to uh, to uh, do a photo walk with. <laughs> mm. He he removed the uh, layers off of it. This uh, this E four twenty. I'll bring that oh, with me next time I see you. I don't yeah, know. Is it, so is it a model it, camera? Is it infrared or? Yeah, it still takes color. I guess they removed the infrared filter. Huh. And so I haven't talked about that, but okay, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'll try and have Ben on again soon, but um, you guys, uh, I may be back tomorrow. 
with a special live stream, something else de dealing with like uh, Photo Lab and Deep Prime because tomorrow's the last day for their discount. So I, I want to, you know, give everyone, you know, some more information about that. But in any case, I, I appreciate you all being here, taking time out of your day and spending it with us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. All right. Sounds good, Rob. Talk. talk all right. You. Take it easy, Ben. Bye-bye. Yeah.